Okay, we are in the <coughs> last section of this book on sustaining the commons and we are in the section called systems perspective. We looked at uh, rules, norms and strategies or shared strategies, you know, slight distinctions but for formal analysis in terms of the framework, institutional analysis and development, it's uh, important. So anytime you say system, systems perspective, uh, feedbacks and stability become the most critical aspects. You all have a sense of what a system is and there are formal definitions and we'll look at some examples here. So we'll learn here some key uh, concepts. Uh, we'll be introduced to system dynamics, feedbacks and resilience. The concept of resilience keeps coming up uh, in adaptation, sustainability, and so on. Learn that systems can have different possible outcomes and can flip from one stability domain to another. This has become another big discussion point in terms of tipping points in the earth system. Become aware that concepts like resilience and robustness are frequently used in sustainability studies. So we used it a lot in the adaptation course uh, if you've been following me on that one uh, and beyond going beyond dealing with disasters disaster management beyond just coping with climate crisis oh, i hate this word but climate uh, impacts that are already here we are also want to build resilience into the future so there is a difference between resilience and robustness and the engineers use this difference a lot uh, to mean you know what they are supposed to mean uh, I think you also have an intuitive sense about that. So let's go ahead with this chapter on feedbacks and sustainability. So let's start with this idea of what a system is. I just picked this animation from this site here uh, to say that our own body is a system. We have a uh, circulatory system, skeletal system here. To move around like this you need the heart pumping, the uh, endocrine system, the brain has to work, nervous system has to work, muscular system has to work and so on. So you understand in that sense that skeletal system by itself cannot do anything. The uh, digestive system, nervous system, endocrine systems cannot do anything by themselves but when they work together the system is you know something that is going to do uh, a unique thing that's not possible for each of the components and then you have feedback so if you feel thirsty the brain says drink water or if you want to dance the brain sends a message saying move this leg this way or hand this way unless you are a klutz and you cannot do uh, much of dancing anyways so this is the idea of a system and earth system as we'll see later is a good example of a system we have land atmosphere ocean vegetation cryosphere and you know so on so that's what we mean so let's start with an example of uh, a flipping point that exists that you are uh, aware of but then the idea is extended into tipping points and how close we are to tipping points and so on so elsewhere I have commented on what my views are on you know uh, talking about tipping points and saying constantly that we are very close to them by definition tipping points are not easy to predict and you don't know that you have tipped un you know till you have passed the tipping point so the the uh, challenge is always to know how close you are to a tipping point. This is just an example of uh, crystal clear blue lake uh, here and on the right it's a eutrophic lake. Uh, what does it mean? So here you have uh, there is a nutrient supply happening through runoffs, there is uh, a ecosystem in it, maybe small fish, frogs, whatever birds come in and uh, eat whatever is available that they feed on and so on and there is you know oxygen supply etc etc but when you have something called eutrophication where the nutrients that are coming in increase a lot let's say because of erosion or because of agricultural activities because of uh, deposition from the atmosphere in terms of nitrate being formed from NOx emissions and so on and so forth and when you have enough light and nutrients you get blooms of phytoplankton that is you know usually native to the lake and that bloom uh, grows so fast that's why it's called a bloom that the zooplankton that eat the phytoplankton do not grow fast enough and there is a time lag so you end up having 
too much of a bloom which is not consumed by the zooplankton then it can sink to the bottom uh, if it's a shallow water body then maybe it'll get sequestered into the sea in the in the bottom but often there are microbes aerobic microbes which also eat these dead uh, algae and if they explode in number because there is a huge food source available in terms of dead algae because of eutrophication then they end up consuming all the oxygen and you have anoxia or hypoxia where you have oxygen levels dropping below certain thresholds where many of the living things you know larger creatures um, uh, fish uh, s you know it can be uh, uh, you know shelled organisms like crabs or oysters or other things shrimps uh, crayfish and so on and so forth so depending on where and how it's happening you can see that you can have a clear flipping point in the system so this is obviously means that the uh, we need to control nutrient to avoid creating undesirable states in nearby lakes but the use of fertilization for agriculture also has benefits in terms of food production solving the hunger problem understanding how to avoid flipping the clear lake system into pants uh, the pea soup here is critical and can provide lessons for other types of problems for example we may want to avoid pushing the climate system toward dangerously uh, rapid climate change or causing coral reefs to uh, flip from a healthy state uh, with many fish species uh, to one dominated by slimy weeds and that can choke the coral and kill it as well so we know such a system such a flip can happen but it's always tricky to know when it will happen or how close you are to it because it may be a combination you may have the same level of nutrients coming in but warming may explode the algae as opposed to just the nutrient supply so you have to be because naturally there is a spring bloom where uh, you can see snow in the back here during the cold winter you may have reduced production because light available for photosynthesis may also be low depending on latitude and when sun comes up during spring you do have a bloom it's called a spring bloom but if you have nutrient flow on top of that then spring bloom may become a eutrophication so uh, it may suffer from eutrophication and so on right so the idea of feedback is very simple and very important and you always know that you are using it the thermostat for the AC the refrigerator the heater during the winter or the shower that you take every day at least once hopefully uh, shows how you want to take a shower and you are the person wanting to take a shower and you have a faucet that you can adjust to get the temperature that you like and you can uh, you know expand this situation to where you are staying in a hotel or in a house with many people and you know how fights can break out between siblings who are using different bathrooms and one is using up all the hot water or turning uh, the knob to reduce the temperature and so on so you have some control on adjusting the faucet mixing hot and cold water to get the temperature you want but in a situation in a hotel where if everybody is trying to take a shower and the amount of water available uh, the flow may depend on how many people are turning on the faucet and so on so you can have endogenous and exogenous variables which can affect these kind of feedbacks which obviously is what happen when, what happens when you're trying to sustain the commons and you have many many users right but in a simple sense you have positive feedbacks and negative feedbacks so if you have state A and uh, user or forcing B <coughs> then uh, doing something here may push the point A you can think of this as uh, let's say a glacier melting so let's say uh, radiation or greenhouse gases increase and warming happens and glaciers begin to melt so increased temperature increased melt let's say that's a positive feedback they go you know in the increasing direction and increasing uh, so increasing uh, melting will reduce the albedo and increase the uh, absorption of uh, energy from the Sun because reflectivity goes down which means the melting rate will increase so that's also a positive feedback and that will increase the temperature as well so if you have two feedbacks that 
amplify the initial perturbation which is coming from human uh, uh, contribution to increasing greenhouse gases and trapping outgoing thermal energy then you have a runaway effect on glacier melt okay this has happened in the past for example but most of the things we use like an electric blanket or the refrigerator or the air conditioner they are negative feedback in the sense you set a thermostat if temperature goes below that the thermostat will uh, turn off the AC and if temperature goes above the threshold it will kick in the AC so then uh, cooling can happen so you have uh, a negative and positive feedbacks possible based on the thermostat setting and this is kind of typically what you have so if you multiply the negative and positive feedbacks the net feedback here is negative so initial perturbation doesn't get amplified so it's a stable system so this is obviously a very simple situation we'll look at the earth system where you have many 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 feedbacks just like using a resource where you have many players and you want norms strategies and rules to avoid uh, runaway positive feedbacks that uh, like the example of the the bank failures we talked about where some rumor starts everybody starts withdrawing money and soon you have the bank running out of cash because they take your cash they invest it elsewhere to give you interest but if everybody wants cash at the same time then they will not have that much cash in store okay so maybe I should leave this here because I have to run to another meeting but uh, we can quickly maybe do an example if we look back at figure 2.5 on the institutional analysis and development framework we can also consider the IAD which is this uh, a system representation of governance problems the outcomes of the action situation feedback into the contextual variables or directly into the action situation again so this is what we mean by feedback uh, in this chapter we discuss the systems perspective more explicitly since there are a number of related concepts that are increasingly used in sustainability studies so here is a framework for institutional analysis and development that we looked at before so we talked about exogenous variables like biophysical conditions attributes of the community which converts rules into norms internally or uh, decides on how the vulnerable will be taken care of how, how biodiversity will be protected you know non-market goods cost benefit analysis of protecting non-market goods and so on and so forth and there are rules in use and those are apl applicable to the participants or the actors in the action situation so there is the action situation so the action situation is affected by participants interacting with each other uh, whether it's using the common good or dealing with each other in in business or in university and so on so you get some feedback there between the exogenous variables and the action situation and the participants and the interactions and that determine you know you have typically evaluation criteria like exams grading etc in the university setting sales pricing distance etc for shopping and so on and that determines the outcomes which typically have feedbacks to the exogenous variables in terms of uh, biophysical conditions and how the attributes of the community react to the outcome based on their evaluative criteria which may be implicit or explicit and they affect the rules in use right so this is a good feedback system and immediately you see how hard it is to figure out whether that is a net negative feedback or positive feedback unless you ensure that you don't have net positive feedback in the sense of amplifying small perturbations into uh, unmanageable situations so we'll come back and then introduce the concept of resilience which again is something you are intuitively used to it is where the perturbation doesn't uh, grow but also the system returns to a previous functionality at some speed or it doesn't just drift away from the functionality and has some resilience so that perturbations are damped out and it comes back to functional whether it's a lake uh, after eutrophication uh, so you have to then look at how quickly it will recover and uh, you know uh, what is the functionality level that will return and so on and so forth so you can imagine many things infrastructure you want them to be resilient 
to the storms and even to earthquake but as we talked in adaptation there will be irreducible risks so earthquakes are uh, you know natural hazards that can be so large that you cannot really protect everything against all magnitudes of earthquake right so resilience is a good concept that we'll come back and look at so see you in the next podcast